This episode of Seriously Strange is brought to you in part by Simply Safe. Nowadays, most places we go to, whether to a store, a school, or a friend's house, there will be the eyes of cameras watching. For many, security cameras are not only to monitor the safety of a particular place, but are also a safeguard for the mind. We feel like there's something protecting us, or perhaps a record of the truth if anything were to unfortunately happen. However, we also don't typically expect to need it, much like with insurance. We buy it superstitiously, hoping it'll never come to that. But we have it just in case. The tragic reality, though, is that security cameras pick up the horrors of humanity, from attacks to even the last breaths people take. When seeing such footage, there's a strange sensation of seeing what isn't for us to see, as if we were peeking through someone's window. The following cases will show the true eeriness that emanates from security footage that precedes or follows disturbing fates. Terry Missy Bevers was a 45-year-old fitness instructor. She was married to Brandon Bevers and was the mother of three children. Additionally, she was a very active member of her community and held early morning fitness classes at the Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas. At around 4 in the morning on April 18, 2016, she was brutally murdered at the Creekside Church of Christ as she was preparing for one of her classes. It's alleged that she had not been at the church for long before she was murdered. She was then subsequently found an hour later by her students. However, the motion-activated security cameras at the church picked up a highly peculiar occurrence. A person had entered the church in full SWAT gear, even with police written on the individual's back. Due to the getup, it's still to this day unclear whether it was a man or a woman. In the footage, the individual is seen wielding a hammer, which eventually would be the murder weapon. According to the police reports, Bevers died due to multiple puncture wounds to her head and chest. The individual is seen walking along hallways, opening doors, peering, and most likely looking for Bevers herself. It's important to note the killer's gait. Their right foot is consistently turned outwards, making their walk uneven and rather specific. It's alleged that Missy and her husband Brandon were having both marital and financial issues. At the time of her murder, Brandon was on a fishing trip 600 miles away from Midlothian. An additionally peculiar detail is that a Nissan Altima was spotted in the church parking lot from 1.58 a.m. to 2.04 a.m. There is no identification of the owner of the car or why anyone was there in the first place. As always, people on the internet have come up with theories about who committed the murder. A popular take is that Randy, Missy Bever's father-in-law, is culpable. The first aspect is that the individual in the footage was somewhere between 5'2 and 5'7. Though this is a rather large range, it is said that Randy fits the height and weight displayed in the footage. Secondly, when comparing the footage from the church and footage of Randy, the gait seems similar, with an emphasis on the right foot. In side-by-side -side footage, there is a defined and uncanny similarity. Thirdly, there were reports that Missy was cheating on her husband and had flirtatious interactions with another individual on social media. Missy was also on LinkedIn, where she allegedly received a creepy message from an unknown individual. Some believe that due to Missy and Brandon's struggle, Randy had a vested interest in killing her. In fact, just a few days after her murder, Randy reportedly brought a triple XL women's shirt 
stained with blood to the cleaners. His justification to account for the blood was from a dog injury. Surprisingly, his vet actually confirmed this. Lastly, people were also suspicious because he was allegedly out of town as well. What were the odds that both father and son were out of town in two separate places the exact night Missy was killed? To this day, we still have no answers. Seriously Strange will resume right after this shout out to our sponsor, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is an easy to use, customizable home security system that's free from contracts and hidden costs, and they just underwent a fresh new upgrade, making their devices now half the size with speeds five times faster and a range at nearly twice what they used to be. When it comes to home security systems, Simply Safe is like no other. You can order it online or over the phone, and suddenly a box will arrive at your door. But don't worry, Ted Kaczynski has been in prison for a long time, and I'm pretty sure they don't allow him to send out packages. <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, can you imagine? Plus, if you're like me, you're not important enough for him to even care about. <laughs> Damn it. But anyway, Simply Safe arrives right at your door. You can set it up in under an hour. And once it's set up, such as with door and window sensors, your house will be professionally monitored 24 7. They're like stalkers, except they're the good guys, so they're actually nothing like stalkers. They've got sensors to cover every entry point to your home and tons of other things you're going to love. They've got a video doorbell, a remote activated automatic door locking system, HD cameras, glass break sensors, and other sensors like temperature sensors to detect if things are getting a bit too chilly around the house, like if you have ghosts constantly walking around sucking all the heat out of everything, and water sensors, which I personally use just in case my dish washer decides to have a little too much fun and gets the floor wet. <laughs> it happens to all of us from time to time, I don't judge. And the price? 50 cents a day. That's like not even the cost of a cup of coffee. That's like the cost of the cup itself. And no contracts to worry about. Simply Safe is here to protect you from shady people, not to be shady themselves by hitting you with hidden fees. And they've even won the US News and World Report's best overall home security of 2020. And by going to the description below and checking out my link to simplysafe.com slash Rob Gavigan, you can begin your journey towards turning your home into a mini Fort Knox. If you watch my channel, you know how important it is to have some kind of security in your life. And personally, I love the idea of being able to record what happens outside of my home day and night. That's called comfort, baby. Everything is incredibly simple to set up. Pulling the tabs out of each device to activate the battery is a lot of fun, too. <laughs> it's all incredibly reliable and helps make my house feel like a, a house. Yeah, a house with muscles that's ready to beat the chocolate out of anyone who dares step foot on my property with ill intent. Or maybe you might even see some animals frolicking about. <laughs> that's always cool, too. It all works super well, just as designed, and I personally couldn't be happier. I'm gonna be honest, when they sent me this in the mail, I moaned a little. Just a little. It's phenomenal. One particular feature I enjoy is the fob, so in case I forgot to arm my house but I'm already on my way out, it's super simple to just hit a single button and BAM! Your house just got its black belt, baby. And no more having to remember the number for 911. The monitoring center calls the fuzz for you. It also reminds you if you've left something open. I usually go to sleep with all my doors and windows wide open. I just totally forget to close them. Not with Simply Safe. So go down to the description below and hit up my link to simplysafe.com slash Rob Gavigan to learn more about their impeccable system that's going to make you feel like the king or queen of your castle. Or house. You probably don't have a castle. But if you do, hit me up. We can hang. Thanks so much for listening. And now, back to the episode. Ellie Tran was 35 and the mother to her two-year-old daughter. Her family had moved from Vietnam to Virginia Beach in order to assist her in raising her daughter, as she was a single parent. She had recently ended a tumultuous relationship with a man named Joseph Merlino III, who also was the child's father. Merlino owned a phone repair shop. 
After falling pregnant, Tran immediately voiced the significance of having her family involved in her daughter's life. In fact, once her parents moved from Vietnam, they lived in the same home as Tran. Merlino did not approve of this and declined to live with them. Though Merlino was reportedly extremely controlling and sometimes even scared Tran, she tried to make the relationship work as she had traditional beliefs and didn't want a separated family. Before their imminent breakup, Tran had reported Merlino to the police. He had reportedly grabbed her by the neck and threatened to put her under the ground. This allegedly occurred in front of their daughter. Merlino didn't face much of a repercussion except a fine. Tran had been working many hours on end as a manicurist to ensure she could provide for her daughter as well as take care of her parents. Though she had split from Merlino, they were involved in a battle for the custody of their daughter, which kept them relatively close still. In diary entries, Tran admitted to being afraid of Merlino, who had allegedly followed her as well as tried to break into her home. This was the catalyst for her to get security cameras installed outside of her house. As she got home on Valentine's Day in 2017, after work, at around 8 p.m., she was surprised by Merlino. The security camera footage shows her exiting her car when Merlino jumps out from behind the bushes and grabs at her. What isn't directly noticeable in the footage is that Merlino had a syringe filled with a lethal dose of cyanide. He plunged it into her upper leg, effectively poisoning her. He then ran off as she seemed to be left in a state of shock and panic. Tran managed to call 911, but within 15 minutes was unconscious. She was rushed to the hospital, but four hours later was declared as brain dead. The next day, she was taken off life support. When brought in for questioning, Merlino first claimed he had been hundreds of miles away visiting family at the time of Tran's murder. His phone pinged at towers in the area, but there had been no activity, no calls or messages, suggesting he may have simply left it there to support a false alibi. In January of 2017, Merlino reportedly went to a pizza joint every single day. While there, a co-worker recalls him receiving a package at the pizza shop. In fact, on January 24th, Merlino's internet history showed that he had looked up how many milligrams of cyanide will kill you, as well as what if cyanide gets injected. He had also ordered a steel syringe via Etsy, which was in the package he received. Merlino denied he had made the searches online and claimed that it was the computer of his cell phone repair business, and half a dozen people had access to it. Once he was jailed and awaiting trial, Merlino went on a two-month hunger strike and lost 40 pounds. The police believe this was a ploy to look different than he did in the security camera footage. Additionally, they believed he wore a reflective shirt in order to cause a glare in the camera to make his identification more difficult. Merlino had already found another girlfriend and wrote coded letters from jail to try to get her to lie for him. The intercepted letters seemed to say that he wanted his girlfriend to create a fake chat history and claim they'd been video calling in order to give him an alibi. Finally, Merlino was found guilty of his crime and was sentenced to life in prison. To complete the grimness of the situation, when brought to sentencing, Merlino was foaming at the mouth and unresponsive. Doctors said it could have been stress-induced, while the prosecution insisted it was an act. Merlino blamed his lawyers for his sentence and claimed he'd appeal. As of now, there is no record of it, and he's still right where he belongs, in prison. Stephen Griffiths is a 49-year-old man who was born in Yorkshire, England. 
Griffiths began his criminal behavior as a young teenager, starting with minor offenses like shoplifting, which rather quickly progressed into violent behavior with knives. At the young age of 17, he was sentenced to three years in youth custody after cutting an employee's face with a knife. He even admitted to his probation officers that he fantasized about becoming a serial killer. Fast forward to 1990, Griffiths was again in legal trouble as he had held a knife to a girl's throat. He was sentenced to two years in prison. Griffiths developed an unhealthy interest in serial killers and began collecting books focused on violent crime. The negative impact of his killer fixation reached a high when he invited his then-girlfriend to his apartment and she found it entirely covered in plastic. That relationship swiftly ended, like many others did as well, due to his abusive behavior and his tendency to stalk. To continue his downward spiral, in 2001, Griffiths began to drink heavily as well as take drugs. After completing his bachelor's in psychology, Griffiths began his PhD program at the University of Bradford. During his program, being unemployed, Griffiths spent a large portion of his time online. He also began downloading hardcore violent pornography, most likely to help quell his urges. However, in 2009, all the red flags that had come up along the way and had coiled around him so tightly began to unfurl. Griffiths gave in to his wanting to kill and began preying on prostitutes in his area of Bradford. It's alleged that Griffiths killed in that specific area in order to pay tribute to a killer named Peter Sutcliffe, who had also killed in that area. It's important to note that Griffiths not only looked up to a murderer, but Sutcliffe was also known for prowling in the red light district because he liked the vulnerability of prostitutes. On June 22, 2009, Griffiths took Susan Rushworth, a prostitute, back to his apartment. He killed her and then dismembered her in his bathtub. His next victim was in April of 2010, named Shelley Armitage, a 31-year-old who was also a sex worker. His last victim was Suzanne Blamires. Blamires was 36 and had attempted to escape the fate his other victims had endured. Unfortunately, as recorded on the CCTV camera that had been specifically installed to monitor Griffiths himself, Blamires was shot fatally with a crossbow and also stabbed. This footage would be critical in his arrest and conviction. It's alarming to see how blasé Griffiths seems walking up to the camera with continued eye contact. His middle finger to the camera almost seems like a taunt, a mixture of showing his lack of remorse along with a carefree mindset. It's especially jarring because if someone only saw the middle finger instance, there would be no indication he had just violently ended someone's life. When in court, Griffiths referred to himself as the crossbow cannibal, as he allegedly consumed parts of his victims. Griffiths pled guilty to all three murders, and is currently serving life in prison. He has tried to end his life multiple times since his incarceration. It always feels somewhat like a surreal experience to witness devastating moments of people's lives on camera. We're so used to taking photos and videos of moments that are significant and that we want to remember forever, yet here we've witnessed footage that's unforgettable in different ways. In the end, the least we can hope for is that this footage brings truth and ideally justice. If you have any information regarding the murder of Missy Bevers, you are urged to contact the Ellis County tip line at 972-775-7624. There is a $50,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest and indictment.
Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe now because you won't want to miss what's next. And don't forget to hit the notification bell to ensure that YouTube notifies you of when I upload a new episode. Also, check out Simply Safe in the description below. They're a great service and can help to keep you and your loved ones safe. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.